Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's very nice and very gratifying for me to make it to Cornell. I had some discussions with Sid about 25 years ago of coming to visit Cornell. At the time, it was not possible for me for family reasons. So uh, this is my visit 25 years later. Uh, it's very pleasant to be here. It's a beautiful time to be in Ithaca. And uh, I'm hoping today, I, I received instructions from the department to try to say something that people could understand that wasn't all very technical. So I'm going to show you something. Uh, it'll get technical at the end, but in the beginning, what I really want to give you a sense of is what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Why do we think it's important? And, uh, and, and what don't we know? Okay. So this is, in fact, a talk about fractional calculus. And I'm going to start. Well, there's an abstract for the talk. Eh, you're already here, so let me just say I'm going to talk about some really cool stuff. Uh, I do want to acknowledge this is joint work with a number of people uh, scattered all over the world. And one of the things you'll notice when you read down this list is that not all of these people are mathematicians. People in probability and statistics, people in applied math, people in geological sciences. Uh, this really is interdisciplinary research, and it came out of a real problem from interdisciplinary research. I'm also going to mention, if you're interested in, in fractional calculus, uh, there are two recent books. Um, one, uh, this first book came out of a PhD level course in our department. It's really to teach uh, graduate students in probability and statistics about uh, jump processes and their connections to fractional calculus. So this is a fairly recent book. And, uh, and the second book is actually an undergraduate book. It's a mathematical modeling book. And in the latest edition, which is the fourth edition, there is, and by the way, you can read it in Chinese or Japanese if you don't like to read it in English. All are available. Um, the very last two sections of the book are about particle tracking and fractional calculus and applications to hydrology for undergraduates. So, uh, a long, long time ago, some guys named Newton and Leibniz invented derivatives. And at that very same time, Leibniz wrote a letter to L'Hopital where he broached the idea of a derivative of fractional order uh, just as a concept. And he said, you know, from this someday useful conclusions will be drawn. So that was the beginning of fractional calculus. It started a long, long time ago. It actually started by the people who started uh, ordinary calculus. Um, but nobody really used fractional calculus for anything until recently. Um, I have to qualify that a little bit. There's a guy named Heaviside, who you might know from the Heaviside function. Um, Heaviside was more of an engineer than a mathematician, for which he received some criticism. At the time, there was no such thing as an engineer. Uh, but he was kind of informal in his mathematics. And the way he used fractional calculus was this. He started with the diffusion equation, where you have the first derivative in time and the second derivative in space. He took the square root of the operators on both sides. He got a first derivative in space and a one-half derivative in time. And he actually used this to construct solutions to the diffusion equation. So I guess that's the first application that I know. But generally speaking, nobody used fractional derivatives for anything until 20 or 30 years ago. And then slowly people started to see that there was some potential here. And now they are applied literally in all areas of science and engineering. So what is it? I'd like to start there. What is a fractional derivative? So they were invented by Leibniz. And I just want you to use your imagination now. Let's take some simple functions and ask yourself, if I know what the first derivative is, and if I know what the second derivative is, and if I know what the third derivative, what would be the derivative of order 1.6? What would be the derivative of order 0 0.25, or the derivative of order pi over 3? OK, so let's start with the exponential function. We know that if we take the first derivative of e to the lambda x, we just put a lambda in front, we get lambda e to the lambda x. If we take a second derivative, we get lambda squared. If we take a third derivative, we get lambda cubed. So somehow, if there's such a thing as a 1.5 derivative of that function, it should be lambda to the 1.5 times e to the lambda x. And that certainly makes sense. And that certainly interpolates between the integer order derivatives. So if there is such a thing as a fractional derivative, we would know how to calculate it in that case. Uh, let's do the power law next. 
When you take the first derivative of a power law, the power goes down by one. If you take the second derivative, it goes down by two. And if you take the third derivative, it goes down by three, etc. So certainly, if you took the fractional derivative of a power law, it should go down by, well, the, the order of the fractional derivative, whatever it is. So the 1.5 derivative of x to the fourth should have an x to the 2.5 in it. But then the question is, well, times some constant, right? So if you take the derivative of x to the fourth, you get four times x cubed, and then you get four times three times x squared, and you get basically, you know, something like factorials. And, and actually, if you, if you write this uh, formula here, if p and alpha are integers, this is exactly the right formula. So gamma of p plus one is p times p minus one times p minus two down to p minus alpha, if you take alpha derivatives. And it turns out that the same formula is true for fractional order derivatives. So if you understand the integer order derivatives in the correct sense, the formula interpolates nicely. As is often the case in mathematics, you solve a problem that you understand and then you look at a problem that you don't understand and the mathematical symbology guides you to the answer. If you formulate the question correctly, as a reviewer of one of my very first papers said to me, or wrote in the review, the correct approach is the approach that generalizes. So the correct formula for the, fraction, for the integer derivative is the one that also works in the fractional case. Now, let's talk about sines and cosines. Derivative of a sine is cosine. Derivative of the second derivative of the sine is minus the sine, and then you get minus the cosine and then back to the sine again. What are you doing there? Well, you're actually making a phase shift. You're just making a shift. And if you think of the way you take the derivative as a shift of pi over 2, then what you can see is when you take a fractional derivative, you could just shift by pi over 2 times the order of the fractional derivative. And, and there is a sense in which all these formulas are exactly correct, and they involve fractional derivatives. Okay, That's one way to understand fractional derivatives. How would you evaluate a fractional derivative for some simple function? Okay. Now, I'm not completely satisfied with that, nor should you be. And there are different ways to under, understand fractional calculus, but the way that I find the most compelling and the most useful in terms of applications, also kind of nice mathematically, is a connection between fractional calculus and probability. So I want to explain this to you. Okay. Before I do, I have to explain, uh, and I may be telling you things you already know, I don't mind. You probably don't mind either. Um, I want to go back and review the connection between probability and the diffusion equation. Okay, so this is a very powerful idea. Connecting random walks, Brownian motion, and the diffusion equation. This connection between particle models and stochastic processes and partial differential equations is used many times in many different ways by scientists and engineers all the time. So for example, Brownian motion is a way to approximate a random walk and vice versa. If I have particles that follow a random walk and I track enough of those particles and I make a histogram of the locations, I can solve a diffusion equation. And, and extensions of this idea are used for solving lots of engineering problems and science problems. So here, just for notational purposes, I take a random variable. It has, let's just say it has a density, which means if I integrate this function, I get a probability. The density has a Fourier transform. My Fourier transform says, Integrate e to the minus ikx. The minus is not common for probabilists, but it's common for people to do PDEs. Uh, if, you, if you like characteristic functions, I just put a minus sign. Okay. So here's e to the minus ikx. It's uh, expanded in a Taylor series. Once I expand it in a Taylor series, if I integrate term by term, what do I get? Well, 1 times f of x dx, if I integrate, I get the integral of f, which is 1, so that's here. If I integrate this guy, I've got x times f of x, so that's the first moment, the mean, if you like. Here I've got an x squared. Uh, the i squared became a minus. So I have minus 1 half k squared times the second moment, and so you can do an expansion of all the moments. And, and for certain kinds of probability distributions, this is why they're, you know, if you know, if they have moments of all orders, and if you know all the moments, then you know the probability density. Why? Because you know it's Fourier transform from this formula. Okay. So it's about moments. Now, the central limit theorem. Make, suppose the first moment is zero, so that our particle jumps have mean zero. They're as likely to be positive or negative. In some sense, they balance out. 
Suppose the second moment is two. I'm just doing that to make the one half go away, but it makes the argument simple. Then the Fourier transform of the density is one minus k squared. So the i k mu one was zero. The one half k squared mu squared mu two mu two was two. It canceled the one half, and it just looks like this. Just this nice simple thing. When you prove the central limit theorem, this is generally how you do it. So this is the Fourier transform of the probability density of one random variable. If you add up random variables and they're independent, then the density of the sum is the convolution of those densities, and Fourier transform turning convolutions into products. So we're taking the nth power of that Fourier transform. Now, if you just take the nth power, it's not going to converge to anything. You need to normalize, so you divide by the square root of n. You can show in a Fourier transform that if you divide by the square root of n, then you're going to divide uh, the wave number by the square root of n. So the Fourier transform of this guy is just k over root n to the nth power. Now I write it down. 1 minus k over root n squared plus some higher order terms to the nth power. So that's 1 minus k squared over n plus some higher order terms. These higher order terms have higher powers of n in the bottom, in the denominator, which means asymptotically they, they don't contribute to the limit. And now we have 1 plus something over n to the nth power, and we know that converges to the exponential. So there you go. Very simple. Calculation says we're getting e to the minus k squared. Now, this gives us the limiting, the Fourier transform of the limiting density. Look it up in the table if you like, or do a complex contra integration. Invert that Fourier transform, and you find a Gaussian density. So what does it say? It says that if you add up a bunch of independently, independently identically distributed particle jumps, let's say, and then divide by the square root of the number of jumps, the probability distribution converges to a nice normal bell-shaped curve. Okay, good. So far, so good. Oops. Uh, next step, Brownian motion. X sub n is the jump of the n particle. S sub n is then the location of the particle after n jumps. Let's expand the scales in time and space. So we expand the time scale by a factor of r. So instead of s of t, we look at s of rt. We take greatest integer so that it's, you know, because it's only defined for integers. So this expands the time scale linearly. And then in the spatial scale, we have to divide by the square root of that. And when we do, we get something like this. Now we have k squared over r to the rt, that's the number of jumps. The r comes from the r to the minus 1 half, so it was k over r squared. Basically the same argument as before, and so now we get e to the minus k squared t in the limit. And what I'm saying then is if you look at this stochastic process of particle jumps, and if you look at the one-dimensional distributions of that stochastic process, then they have probability densities, and those probability densities converge to this function, which now depends on k and t. But if we invert, we can see that we get a Gaussian distribution for all time. So if you like, these are the distributions of the Brownian motion and the limit. Okay. Now, what are we really saying here? And there's, I did this in R as a very simple R code that makes this work. I'll show it to you actually later. Here's 10 jumps, here's 100 jumps, here's 1,000 jumps. The scaling limit, if you like this as Donsker's theorem demonstrated, is a Brownian motion. You take a random walk and you look, you, you look at it after a lots of jumps. You look at it after a long time and it looks like a Brownian motion. It converges in all, any sense you'd like almost to a Brownian motion and let me talk about Brownian motion. It doesn't matter what the jump distribution was. I'm going to assume mean zero and if I assume the second moment was two but if the second moment is anything, it doesn't matter. It's just, a, uh, it's just a difference in the scale of s. You get the same kind of pictures. Uh, this is a random sample path, and so if I, if I do it over and over and over again, I'm going to get different pictures. But these pictures are, in some sense, all the same. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here is actually the simulation. And I'll run it again, and I'll run it again. This is a 1,000 particle jump. It doesn't really matter what the probability distribution is of these particle jumps. What matters is that they're independent and identically distributed. They have mean zero and a finite variance. That's all that matters. 
Now, every one of those pictures is different, but in some sense they're all the same, right? In what sense are they all the same? They, they have the same kind of roughness, right? I mean, what properties of them are all the same? Well, I mean, we can say, in fact, the properties of them that are all the same are, this graph is actually a random fractal. Its dimension is 3 halves. What do I mean by a random fractal? Well, to be really simple, cover that curve with a bunch of little boxes of size 1 over n, OK? The number of boxes you need to cover that curve depends on n, and it grows like n to the 3 halves. That's what I mean by a random fractal of dimension 3 halves. And I wrote it as 2 minus 1 over 2 for a specific reason that you'll see later. Um, there's, that's a very simplistic view of fractals. Nevertheless, what I said was true. OK. So we talked about random walks. We talked about Brownian motion. What about the diffusion equation? Well, here's the diffusion equation. It says the first derivative in time equals the second derivative in space. Um, I'm going to solve it. It doesn't take long. I already proved the central limit theorem. It wasn't very rigorous, but it's, it's the basic steps. Now I'm going to take the Fourier transform of both sides of that equation. When I do take the Fourier transform of both sides of the equation, I'm going to use the fact that when you take a derivative of a function, that's the same as multiplying its Fourier transform by ik, where ik is the wave number. So if I take the second derivative, I multiply by the square of ik. I haven't done anything in the time variable, so it's still just a derivative. But now the spatial variable, the spatial derivative disappears. It becomes just an ordinary differential equation, and it's this one. The derivative is minus k squared times the function. Luckily, I don't know much about differential equations, but I can solve that one. The derivative is proportional to the function. It's simple. It's exponential. Okay. So the solution is e to the minus k squared t. That's that's the solution that that I get very simply. And you know, I remember e to the minus k squared t was exactly what I got for the Brownian motion, right? So in fact. If I take a cloud of diffusing particles and I take the limiting density, which is the Gaussian density of the Brownian motion, I also get the solution to the diffusion equation. So I can think of the diffusion equation as what happens when a bunch of particles spread out according to some random walk and I look at their limiting densities. Okay? And so I can say intelligent things now about the diffusion equation. Let me talk about some properties that are very simple. You know, A is my diffusing process. If I look at time one, and if I multiply it by t to the one half, then I get exactly the same density as I would at time t. How do you see that? Well, I mean, here's e to the minus k squared. Here's A1. It's just e to the minus k squared. I replace k by square root of t times k. And then, of course, I get a t. So this is the solution at time t. What does it tell me? It tells me that if I look at a random particle location at time one and multiply it by t to the one half, I get the probability, the random par probability particle distribution at time t. So it says a cloud of diffusing particles spreads at the rate t to the one half. Okay. That's a physical property that I could check to see if my data fits a Brownian motion, right? If it fits the diffusion equation, I can look at the rate at which particles spread. Also, I know that I get a symmetric bell-shaped density curve, and the tails fall off like e to the minus x squared. And here's the problem, or the opportunity, if you will. Uh, lots of real data doesn't look like that. Okay, It's not a symmetric bell-shaped curve. Uh, it, it spreads faster, let's say, than t to the 1 half, and, and uh, the tails fall off. Not like e to the minus x squared, but something slower. I'll show you some real data in a minute. But first. Let's just think about what we have. A diffusion profile, symmetric, tails fall off very fast, spreads like the square root of time, the peak falls like the square root of time. Okay? That's the diffusion profile. So if you see real data, you ask yourself, does it look like that? Now, here's the problem. If I had some data that doesn't look like, I mean, if I just had some particles, diffusing and, and I look at the cloud of particles and how the shape of the plume looks like after some time. How on earth can it not look like Brownian motion? I mean that was a pretty universal model, right? All I assumed is, you know, mean zero particle jumps uh, with finite variance. That's it. And 
if the mean wasn't zero, I can just subtract off the mean, and then I, I should still get diffusion. It should still be the same shape, right? So the question is, can anything else happen? What would make the central limit theorem not be true? Okay, so I give you an example. Suppose you have particle jumps that fit this model. Asymptotically, the probability of jumping more than a distance x in a positive direction falls off like a power law x to the minus alpha. That means the density, if you take the derivative, looks something like this. Now you have some moments and you have an integral that looks like this. And think about what happens as you go to infinity. You have x to the k, x to the minus alpha minus 1. You have k minus alpha minus 1. You take the integral, you get x to the k minus alpha. And if k minus alpha is positive, you're in trouble because your moment doesn't exist. So if alpha is less than 2, the second moment doesn't exist and the central limit theorem doesn't hold because the finite variance isn't true anymore. The second moment doesn't exist. So let's just say alpha is between 1 and 2. We often see this in applications. First moment is 0. Then, instead of the Fourier transform before, which was 1 plus 1 minus k squared, now it looks like this. 1 plus ik to the alpha. If alpha was 2, that would be 1 minus k squared. Okay. So, do the same thing as before. When you add these guys up, you'll get the nth power of this. And then you want to divide by something so that it goes to a limit. If you divide by the square root of n, it won't converge to a limit. That was n to the 1 over 2. Now we're going to use n to the 1 over alpha, where alpha is between 1 and 2. So do that calculation. You put the n to the minus 1 over alpha ik here. You can see what's going to happen. You use the alpha 1 over alpha here because there's an alpha power. So you get 1 plus ik to the alpha over n. Take the n power, let n go to infinity. Again, all the rest of those terms are higher order. It converges to e to the ik to the alpha. Well, I didn't find that in a book on Fourier transform tables, but I happen to know, because of my work as a probabilist, that that's the Fourier transform of a stable density, called an alpha stable density. And the random walk in this case is called a Levy flight. Okay, so what about stable Levy motion? Take a bunch of particle jumps with that distribution, expand the scale in time, uh, shrink the scale in space by r to the one over alpha. Alpha used to be two, now it's not. So now we get this expression, we take the limit, and we get something very much like we did before, e to the t, i k to the alpha. Again, if alpha was 2, it's just e to the minus t k squared, but we've extended it. Now the scaling is like t to the 1 over alpha instead of t to the 1 half. And you can see that again from the Fourier transform very simply. We get a stochastic process called a stable Levy motion, sometimes called a Levy flight. It models super diffusion. We already know something. Instead of spreading like the square root of time, t to the 1 over 2, it spreads like t to the 1 over alpha. Alpha is less than 2. So for example, if alpha was 1, it'd be spreading like t, linearly. If alpha was 3 halves, it would spread like t to the 2 thirds, which is faster than t to the 1 half. So this is super diffusion. This would model plumes that spread faster than Brownian motion predicts. Let's do a heavy-tailed random walk simulation. This is 10. This is 100. This is 1,000. Okay. This is also a random fractal of dimension 2 minus 1 over alpha. And the interesting thing about these guys, and I'll show you a bunch of simulations, is that here, <coughs> the jumps persist in the limit. These all look different. And do you see how they're not quite, here alpha is 1.5. You see how they're not quite as rough as the Brownian motion? They have a little less roughness to them. So the fractal dimension actually went down. They're smoother. But what always happens in these guys is, you know, in the limit, I mean, if you think about a random walk, it converts to Brownian motion. It's jump, 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 jump. But in the limit, the jumps go away because the individual jumps become negligible with respect to the size of the entire sum. But in this case, the size of the biggest jump is not negligible with respect to the size of the entire sum. So you keep seeing them in the limit. And, and so what happens here is you get a stable Levy motion, and it's this limit process mathematically is a process that has jumps in it. Okay? Because the size of the individual particle displacements, the biggest particle displacement in the sum of, say, a million jumps is on the same order as the sum of the million jumps altogether, so the jump sticks around. It doesn't disappear. 
okay? Now, there is like there was a Brownian motion and a diffusion equation for the stable Levy motion, which is a jump process, there is another diffusion equation called the fractional diffusion equation, and it turns out it involves a fractional derivative. All you have to do is you replace the second derivative by a derivative of order alpha. Alpha was the same probability. Remember the probability of jumping more than x units downstream went, fell off like x to the minus alpha. And then we had this alpha stable and one over alpha scaling. So with the same alpha here is the fractional derivative. How do you solve this equation? Well, take the Fourier transform. If one derivative means multiplying by ik to the 1, and two derivatives means by al multiplying by ik to the 2, then 1.5 derivatives means multiply by ik to the 1.5 in Fourier space. So this guy becomes ik to the alpha. Again, the derivative is a constant times the amount. Here's the solution. And darn if that isn't the Fourier transform of the Levy stable densities. So we have the same connection between a random walk, a limit process, and a diffusion equation. But now the random walk has power law jumps. The limit process has power law jumps. It's a Levy stable process, a Levy flight. They call it flights because it's jumping. It's crazy. And the diffusion equation has fractional derivatives. Okay? And one of the things that it's not obvious to see, but the probability densities of these guys, they solve it. They also fall off like a power law. Let me show you a picture. This is the fractional diffusion profile. What do we see here? Skewed to the right. Uh, it's spreading like t. This in this case alpha is 1.5. It's spreading like t to the 1 over alpha, like t to the 2 thirds. So it's actually spreading faster. The peak is falling faster. Uh, these curves do have a mean, but the mean is not at the peak, right? Because they're skewed. So the question is, well, would that be useful for anything? Now I show you some real data. In Columbus, Mississippi, there is an Air Force base. On this Air Force base, they did an experiment. And the experiment goes like this. They drill a well into the ground, and they pour a bunch of tracer into the ground. Some, in this, uh, they use tritium. It's easy to measure the concentration of tritium because it's radioactive. They don't apparently mind pouring it into the ground. It's benign in some sense. Don't ask me how. Then the, the, the water is flowing just the natural. You know, the water in, under the ground is like rivers. It still flows. And so it's flowing downstream at about 0.3 meters per day. They dug a bunch of other sampling wells downstream. And at different times, they'd go out and they'd measure the concentrations. And, and here's the concentration data projected down to one dimension. Um, this kind of sharp peak that pretty much follows it is the solution to a fractional diffusion equation with constant coefficients. Okay. These kind of bell-shaped curves that you see here are the best fitting diffusion model for that data. That's the model that most engineers, in fact, that all engineers were using before we wrote this paper. And with variable coefficients. We didn't even assume constant coefficients. We just fit the best fitting Gaussian for each, you know, just take the mean and the variance of the data. I think you can see that the diffusion model is not very good. And you can see why, right? Because, well, the data has a sharp peak. It's clearly skewed to the right. I mean, we could magnify on these things a little better. Actually, what I'd like to do to show you a little more detail is to take a log-log plot. I'm taking a log-log plot here because I want to look at the, the leading edge of the curve. I'm thinking to myself, suppose there is a contaminant in this groundwater, like tritium, and I don't want to drink it. And suppose the plume is heading toward my drinking water supply. I am very interested in the leading tail of the concentration curve. Now, what you can see from this data, because we see basically a straight line on a log-log plot, well, what has a straight line on a log-log plot? A power law, right? If y is x to the p, then log y is p log x, right? Everybody knows this. You learn it like in high school chemistry. You want to get a power law, you find a straight line on a log-log plot. Well, the stable density has a straight line on a log-log plot for far enough downstream. It falls off like a power law. And you can see that, especially in this picture, the power law is pretty good. Okay, the power law is a pretty good model. Now, the governing equation is just this. Here's the groundwater velocity. Here's the fractional dispersivity. It's a fractional derivative of order 1.1. Provides quite a good fit. Uh, I know you can't quite read these. They go 10 to the minus 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So here's the point I would like to make about 
the fractional diffusion model and the classical diffusion model that I think is germane. Suppose this pollutant is approaching your drinking well, your drinking water source. Uh, the data says the concentration is 10 to the minus 4. The stable model, the fractional diffusion model, says the concentration is about 10 to the minus 4. And the regular diffusion model, the classical, traditional model, says the concentration is 10 to the minus 10. So that's not very good, right? You're underestimating risk by six orders of magnitude. Okay. So fractional derivatives have some bearing on real problems. Here's another one. Uh, when I lived in New Zealand, we worked on modeling invasive species. So this is kind of a toy problem. Let me explain the, the model. This is, if you look at this term, it's just the diffusion equation in two directions. You're, 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 think of the random walk of one uh, animal, or think of an animal and its offspring. Think of a tree and the little trees that grow from the seeds. The question is, what is that displacement between the parent and the child? That's the step in our random walk. Okay, so this says there's some diffusion, and this says there's some growth. So this is the just exponential growth, and this is limits to growth. This is the carrying capacity. So this is the Fisher equation, so standard equation in ecology. And in this problem, what we have, we started with a source of animals here. We let them grow and diffuse the population, and then there's a barrier with a little slit. Think of a river, and there's a log across the river, and the animals can crawl across the log. So what do you see in the traditional model? Well very slowly they diffuse across the crack and you get a little bit of concentration there. Which, by the way, is not at all what we see in real data. What happens if you put in a fractional derivative? So the only thing we did here is we changed this fractional, the, the second derivative in space, that's about, you know, jumps this way to a fractional derivative of order 1.7, which isn't too far from 2. Now look what happens. Not only, and at the same time, in the same conditions, not only do you get much more penetration and much deeper penetration of the invasive species, but if you look carefully, they did not crawl across the log, right? Because look at the center of this plume. It's from here to here. They, didn't, they just jumped across the river, right? So this is non-local. It allows jumps. So this is, in fact, what you see even with plants. It's weird. You wouldn't think of plants as jumping, but you know the seeds of the, of the offspring can end up far away from the seeds of the parent when the bird eats the seed and carries it away, and then something happens we won't talk about. Yeah? How do you interpret the anisotropies in the coefficients of diffusion and in the powers of the diffusion which you have in here? Why is it uh, uh, partial with respect to why? Oh, you mean like, why would I use 1.7 here and 2 here? Yeah. Yeah, j just, I mean, actually, I wouldn't necessarily. I mean, I would look at the data. But um, it's possible if the, if the landscape was homogeneous, you might well see the same order of fractional derivatives in the x and y direction. If the landscape was very heterogeneous, maybe it's a long valley with mountains on the sides, then it's much easier to go up and down the river than it is to go across. There's, that's a very complicated question, and I wrote a whole book about that, and it's that first one I mentioned, okay? But we can talk about that later. But yes, there's lots of interesting questions about should A and B be the same? Should these fractional derivatives be the same? How do you do a fractional diffusion equation in more than one dimension? And I'm not going to talk about much about that today, but I did write a whole book about it, and there's lots of cool pictures in there, okay? What you can see here is the effect of a non-local operator, and I can tell you that for invasive species, they do what they call dispersal kernels. They look at how far the offspring ended up from the parents. And these things follow often kind of pretty nice, beautiful power loss, which makes you think that a power law displacement model would be a good model. OK, now, Pierre and I first got together talking about a reflected stable process. And this became interesting to me for a reason I didn't expect. But, you know, I've been working in fractional calculus since about around the late 1990s. And a question that scientists and engineers often ask me is, what kind of boundary conditions can I use? Like, suppose I want a reflecting boundary condition and I have a fractional diffusion equation. How do I write it? No one knew. And the answer, the very first answer ever to that question came out of this analysis. So let me explain the setup. We take a Levy process that only jumps in the negative direction. Okay, so we had, before we had just positive jumps, now we only have negative jumps. The index is between 1 and 2 again. 
we reflect it. This is the formal mathematical definition of reflection, but basically what we're doing is modifying the process so that it stays in the positive half line. And I'll show you a picture in a minute that'll really clarify what this means. So we get from this a Markov process on the real line. Uh, the, by imposing a barrier, the jump distribution now depends on the location because you can't jump over the barrier and your distance to the barrier depends on your current location. So it's no longer a Levy process, but it is still Markov. There is a semi-group. You might call it the backward semi-group. It's a Feller semi-group. Uh, we have a paper that's forthcoming someday and take transactions of the American Math Society, whose backlog is now over two years. Uh, but it is accepted, it's online, and we showed, for example, that this process has a smooth transition density. This says, roughly speaking, if you start off at location x at time zero, what are the odds that you end up at location y at time t? So, usual transition density. It does have a smooth transition density. Let me show you a picture. There's a nice R code for this in the appendix. I'm not going to run that one. But uh, basically all that happens is anytime you're going to jump through the axis, you just, it makes you stop. And then from there on, it's basically the same. So you can see what's happened is it's kind of like a shifting. All I did is I, is I took the negative jumps and I cut them off so they can't never take you through zero. Now this particular process drifts upward and jumps downwards. The drift upward is compensating for the downward jump so it, that it has mean zero. Okay. So this is the process I'm interested in. There's the sample path. And... Because I do applications, I'm very interested in the forward Kolmogorov equation of this process. In other words, if particles are following this model, then what probability, what partial differential equation describes the evolution of the particle densities over time? So we call that the transition densities. And is there like a boundary condition that involves this boundary that's reflecting? So if I can answer that question, I can say, What's a reflecting boundary condition for a fractional diffusion? Okay. Historically, what happened is we knew the reflecting boundary condition. We thought there was a Markov process that was governed by this. We didn't know what it was, and Pierre told me what it was. So that's how we started working together. Because he was already analyzing this process for some other reasons. But basically, here's a forward equation. So here we're using a negative fractional derivative. If you want to think about what a negative fractional derivative is, you take ik to the alpha, you replace it by minus ik to the alpha. So it's just the opposite direction. Uh, if you had some kind of uh, finite difference, you know, delta y over delta x type business, you just replace delta x by minus delta x. That's all it is. Um, we call that the negative fractional derivative. There are also positive and negative integer derivatives, but since they're just related by a minus sign, people don't usually write it that way. So here's the governing equation. So the first time derivative is the alpha space derivative, and it's a negative derivative just because they're negative jumps. That's all. If I took off the boundary condition, this is simply the governing equation of the fractional diffusion that's skewed to the left rather than skewed to the right. It's the governing, it's the random walk with negative jumps rather than positive jumps. If you like, take everything I did before and just reflect it. It's all the same. But the question is, what makes those guys stay positive? What is the reflecting boundary condition for a fractional diffusion? And here it is. Okay? If the alpha derivative is governing the process, it's the generator of the forward equation, then it's the alpha minus 1 derivative that has to be 0 at the boundary. Now, many of you will know a lot about Brownian motion. Maybe you know about reflected Brownian motion. Everything I told you has to still be true when alpha equals 2. Right? That's just a special case. So what happens when alpha equals 2? Now, well, first of all, if alpha equals 2, the negative derivative and the positive derivative are the same. Right? Because minus ik squared and plus ik squared are the same thing. Because minus 1 squared is plus 1, so it doesn't matter. So it's just the diffusion equation. And then this would say that the first derivative is 0 at the boundary. Or if you like, the normal derivative is 0 at the boundary. That's the way you think about it in multiple dimensions. This is exactly what happens with reflecting Brownian motion. So I can tell you that because many scientists and engineers are working on such problems, they tried to come up with reflecting boundary conditions for fractional diffusion. And typically what they did is they tried to apply this one because that's what they know. And it turns out that's completely wrong because you need, essentially what you're doing is you're setting the flux equal to zero at the boundary 
And the way you get this equation, if you like, is by taking the divergence of the flux. And the divergence involves one derivative. And so in this case, the flux involves alpha minus one derivatives. So that makes perfect sense if you, think, if you really know the uh, derivation of the diffusion equation from conservation of mass and fixed law. It's the same, but the fixed law is fractional. And so this is the zero flux condition. It makes perfect sense when you look at it from a certain point of view. But lots of people did this wrong. And you know, from my point of view, this is the thing. The way to understand the right thing to do here, the correct thing to do here, is to think about probability. This is a completely deterministic question. But how do I know what a reflecting boundary condition is for the diffusion equation? Because I know about reflecting Brownian motion, and I know that there's a boundary condition involved in its forward Kolmogorov equation. Okay? That's how you know. So by doing the probability, you can understand what it means then to extend this to fractional diffusion and what the fraction, what the correct boundary condition should be. So what I have to emphasize here is that nobody knew this. No, this is the first time anyone ever wrote down a diffusion equation with a fractional derivative boundary condition. No one thought of it, but it's actually the right thing to do. And from some sense, it's the obvious thing to do because it's just one less derivative. And, and alpha minus one is one less than alpha, so you think to yourself, oh, that's great. It's the same as diffusion. But, I mean, a lot of times things are more obvious once you already figured them out. right? But it's, it seems reasonable. Okay. You can actually compute this transition densities from that equation. By solving that equation with the boundary condition numerically, you can write down the transition densities for this process. It's a simple MATLAB code. We even printed it in our paper. Let me tell you how we did it. Um, a fractional derivative can also be defined by a finite difference equation. And here it is. Here's the finite difference equation. Um, if alpha is an integer, this is nothing more than the one-sided finite difference approximation to the nth derivative. So if, it, if, if alpha is 1, it's just f of x minus f of x minus h. That's all. And then you divide by h, and everything's fine. If alpha is 2, then you've got f of x. You've got f of x minus h. You've got f of x minus 2h with the coefficients 1 minus 2 and 1, et cetera. And you can extend that. People knew this a long time ago, like 60 or 80 years ago, and many people tried to write code to solve fractional diffusion equations based on this approximation, which is an obvious thing to do, like just an implicit or an explicit Euler method or something like that. Funny thing is, none of it worked. And then in a paper in 2004, we proved that, in fact, all those methods are unstable. It's not that it isn't an approximation. It's a perfectly good approximation. But when you put it in a finite difference code, it gives you an unstable code. Okay. So, and, and the solution is very simple. You just shift by one place where you're evaluating this function, and then you get a stable convergent implicit Euler method, unconditionally stable. You can get stable convergent explicit Euler methods under some conditions. Which, by the way, is the same thing that's true for second derivatives. If you use, if you know your numerical analysis, if you, if you use a one-sided approximation of a second derivative, you get an unstable scheme. You've got to use, well, what we call a two-sided approximation. You've got to shift it a little bit. So the same thing happens here. Uh, then you just enforce the fractional no-flux boundary condition in the obvious way, and then you get a solution. Okay. So I'm almost done. I'll show you the backward equation. So here's the, the same process, reflected stable. When you change from the forward to the backward equation, so these are the forward and the backward Kolmogorov equations, uh, now, x is the variable instead of y. So in other words, a starting point instead of the ending point. That's what makes it the backward equation. So what happened? Uh, and this is the correct backward equation. We didn't derive this. It was now. Uh, first of all, instead of a negative fractional derivative, you get a positive fractional derivative. The negative and positive fractional derivatives are L2 adjoints. Okay? You can prove that by integration by parts. So negative fractional derivative in, in the backward e forward equation is a positive fractional derivative in the backward equation. Instead of a fractional boundary condition, now you get an integer boundary condition, the one that you would expect from looking at Brownian motion. Um, so that's quite different. There's a nice paper in 2011 that computed the backward generator. Uh, Patin and Simon also uh, looked at this problem. They computed the exact domain of the generator. They showed, although you have to read through to an example, to, there's, it's a remark. But in fact, this boundary condition holds for everything in the domain, which you guys proved. 
So what's an application? Why do we, are we interested in this problem? Let's just take this example. Take a Brownian motion in D dimensions. Uh, so the Laplacian is the generator and uh, x is the Brownian motion. And now what you do is you're considering a time fractional problem. The time fractional derivative models power law delays in motion. Okay, that's, it, that's what the time fractional derivative was. And so we're interested in these problems for modeling delays. And it turns out if you can find the solution to the Cauchy problem, then you can get the solution to the fractional Cauchy problem by some kind of transformation. And the transformation is just to replace the time variable by the reflected stable, okay, of index one over theta. And that's a nice application of the spectrally negative alpha stable process, the one with only negative jumps, but, you know, reflected to stay positive. Uh, there's a simple proof, I think, in, in, in terms of time. I'll skip it, but let me just say, we knew another process that you could do this with, and it turned out they had the same distributions. So. There's some argument for that. Uh, and now let me tell you what comes next. Because I'm interested to know what are fractional boundary conditions, I would like to say, well, what if you had a stable process and it had, well, it was limited on both upper and lower. It was on a finite interval. So take that same stable lady process with negative jumps, reflect it to stay inside a positive, uh, just a bounded interval. There is a general method for solving what's called the score high problem. How do you reflect the process so that it stays inside a bounded interval? What you do is you take the original process, you add and subtract some like local times, I mean some non-decreasing processes that, that, that only increase at the boundary. Okay? There's, a, there's a, an explicit formula for this in Burgess' paper. Uh, then you apply the eta representation and the compensation formula to get the backward generator, and then you compute adjoints to get the forward generator. This is the idea. And the boundary conditions come out in the process. This is a complete conjecture. I did some calculations, but I haven't proved it yet, but I will share it with you. Here's what I think is true. The forward equation of that process looks like this. Here are the boundary conditions. There's one for each boundary, A and B. The backward equation looks like this. Here are the boundary conditions. These use positive and negative computo fractional derivatives, which are defined this way. And here we have, again, the negative derivative, but it's modified. Okay. We have here the, the alpha negative derivative for the forward equation with the alpha minus one negative derivative for the boundary condition at the lower end point, which was zero, and just a first derivative at the upper end point. And in the backward equation, we have the first derivative, we get a positive fractional derivative here, and the alpha minus one derivative occurs at the upper end point. And the, the thinking is, that when you're jumping over the boundary, you need a fractional boundary condition. But if you're drifting through the boundary, then the integer order boundary condition like used for Brownian motion is sufficient. Okay, so this is what we're working on now. And well, when we tighten up all the math, then we'll publish it. And I think that's it. I have some references. I'll make these slides available if anybody wants them. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mark, for this very uh, interesting and uh, nice talk. Are there any questions or remarks? So I have a question, actually. So when okay. you presented a uh, uh, forward fractional equation, so for the stable reflected uh, Levy process, right. so you started with a spectrally negative uh, yep. stable. And do you know what would be the equation or the boundary condition in the case where you start with a two-sided? Ah, sure. Uh, okay, so stable. I do actually. Um, I only presented here the one-sided, but if it's two-sided, basically you get you get uh, you get both fractional derivatives, like this one and this one. And you get like all four boundary conditions for both the forward and back. Yeah, fractional boundary condition. Exactly. Some fractional, some integer. And again, you need the fractional boundary condition where you're jumping over the boundary, and you just need the integer boundary condition where you're drifting through the boundary. I also have an idea, and I haven't tightened this up yet, but you know, if you have a forward and a backward equation, if you think about dual Markov processes, like if there's another Markov process for whom the forward equation for my process is the backward equation for that one, then in some sense it reduces the problem, mm -hmm. right? So, and I, and I think that's true in this case.
But like I said, I haven't nailed that down yet. Okay. Can you do a reflection in more than one dimension? Well, we haven't done it, but what I think you can do is this. There is a nice paper about solving the score odd problem in more than one dimension. And so you can then apply this. I forget who wrote it. Uh, you can solve the score odd problem in more than one dimension. You can basically then figure out how you're modifying the Levy measure to get a Markov process that stays inside that domain, let's say a sphere. Uh, and then use a compensation formula, the either representation, to get the backward generator and take edge joints to get the forward generator. What I believe is true is that the normal, I mean, if you take, like, suppose you took the fractional Laplacian, so you have a jump process. What I think is true, and we haven't written it all up in detail yet, is that the normal derivative of order alpha minus one, the directional derivative in the normal to the boundary of order alpha minus one has to be zero for reflecting. This is what I think is true. It's not inconsistent with what I know, but I haven't proved it yet. What's the uh, physical analog of fractional derivative of time? Okay, so what happens with a fractional derivative in space is you get long jumps in space. What happens with fractional derivatives in time is just that you get long waiting times with a power law distribution. So for example, particles are flowing down the river, they're being carried, you're tracking the plume. What happens is they settle into the sediment at the bottom of the river, and they wait for some period of time and then they're released. That, that process is something like you know, a diffusion where you have to wait till you diffuse back up to the boundary. And we know that the time to diffuse to the boundary has, has some power law distribution. It's like a one half stable. So actually you get these power law waiting times. That's what the fractional derivative codes physically. Absolutely. So, for example, if you measure, if you, if you just dump some tracer into a stream and then you go downstream and measure, what you'll see is that the, uh, the concentration at late time falls off like a beautiful power law. Okay, so that shows you that they're being, the particles are being trapped for power law distributed periods of time. Uh, in, electric, in, in electricity spot market prices, what you see is that the prices fluctuate and then they stay constant. Then they start to fluctuate again, and the, and the periods of time over which they stay constant more or less fit a power law. So you actually see it in quite a few applications. So the one-dimensional problem with, with two boundaries, uh -huh. and you solve the diffusion equation with uh, L equals two, mm -hmm. and you look at the station distribution where the time derivative goes to zero. Yep. Then we know that you need two boundary conditions. Right. And if you had L equals four, you need four boundary. Yeah. So now for equals one and a half, you need one and a half standard conditions? No, it's much worse, actually. With, with alpha equals one and a half, you need, well, like I said, like I showed here, with alpha equals one and a half, you need two. But worse yet, this is only jumping backward. If you jump backward and forward, then you actually need four, even if alpha equals 1.5. At least that's my conjecture, and we haven't finished that yet. But it's it's... Yes, that's a great question. What do you, and this, this is exactly the questions that people would ask me. Do I need like one and a half boundary conditions now? And what on earth does that mean? Well, uh, so for example, the theory of ordinary differential equations with fractional time derivatives is fairly well established. And what happens is if you solve something with a fractional derivative of order 3.5, you need four initial conditions, etc. cetera. So you, you, never fractional. Any other questions or remarks? So let's thank Mark again.